Welcome back. Uh, this is Magic Witchcraft and Religion. I'm your instructor, David Leitner, and today we're talking about symbols. Um, what are they? Why are they relevant to studying religion to begin with? They're actually fairly fundamental, so let's get started. So before we get started talking about symbols, we have to understand what a sign is. Signs are just the sort of most basic way to convey simple meaning. Um, that is, I mean, technically signs are things that stand in for other things, but in a very sort of direct way. Now, the relationship may be arbitrary. There is nothing inherently stoppable <laughs> about the color red. There is nothing that is inherently naturally outside of cultural connections to it um, related between the color red and the notion of stopping. That is arbitrary. That's what I mean by arbitrary. So signs are just like that, though. They're very simple ways of conveying a meaning. Words are signs. They're signs that use sound instead of an image to convey meaning. Um, so think of them like a shorthand version of symbols. OK, uh, signs usually aren't very multivocal. That is, they usually have kind of one meaning to everybody in that culture. Uh, and um, and they can be just about anything. Shapes, colors, words, sounds, images, anything like that. Uh, you'll notice here the stop sign itself, right? It doesn't matter which words we put on it. In fact, we don't even need words on it. People will recognize the red, the color red, and the octagon shape as a combination that implies stop. Uh, doesn't matter what you do. That said, there are things you can do with signs. You can combine signs in way that, ways that create new meanings. This is what we do with words in language all of the time. In fact, a lot of this research on signs comes out of linguistics. Um, the uh, Ferdinand de Saussure uh, was an early linguist in the, um, in the 19th century and early 20th century, and he described uh, signs as requiring only two parts a thing that is signified and the thing that signifies it. So a signified and a signifier. And um, and that's all it takes. But from that simple combination, you can actually combine these signs and create something new. So like this sign right here, language, uh, the language that is added to the sign changes the meaning slightly, right? So instead of writing stop on the sign, they have written the word abuse. The idea being that the shape itself, the shape and the color, imply stopping. And combining that with the word abuse leads us to think stop abuse. Uh, this is obviously an anti-domestic violence sort of sign. It, it, it comes from an anti-domestic violence campaign uh, from North Shore University Health System. But this is the fun you can have with signs, right? They're, they, they can do lots of things. Okay, symbols are more elaborate than signs, but they are, at their root, kind of the same thing. They are things that mean, represent, or stand in for other things. Um, they tend to have a wider set of meanings. They tend, the meanings often tend to be more complex. Uh, and usually are, are very emotionally, politically, or culturally charged in some way. They evoke emotions uh, of some kind. Um, now, the anthropologist Sherry Ortner goes even deeper into this notion. Now, there, there are symbols everywhere, uh, but some symbols are what she calls key symbols. Uh, key symbols are Symbols that actually summarize or elaborate a significant piece of a culture's worldview. Uh, so in that way, they're part of a public system of meaning making and, uh, and a public symbolic system. Uh, one that 
everyone shares in that culture. And as a result, they usually act as a sort of cultural uh, model for either how to live or how to do things or how the world is ordered. That is sort of the role of key symbols. Now, within key symbols... Uh, there are a couple of different types. The first are summarizing symbols. These are kind of best described as things that you feel with. These tend to be evoke strong emotions uh, of one kind or another. Uh, they summarize multiple complex ideas about the thing signified at the same time. And, um, and as I said, they contain an immense sort of emotional impact in some way. So the American flag tends to be, uh, evoke very strong feelings in people. Uh, although, interestingly, the American flag is multivocal. It is something that carries multiple meanings within the society that may not always be uh, um, complementary either. Uh, for instance, on the one hand, the flag for a lot of people evokes the idea of America, the good things about America. So it represents the United States. But for some people, that is, you know, uh, freedom and democracy, capitalism, uh, and so forth. Um, but for other people, it represents many of the bad things about the United States, like uh, massive... Uh, economic inequalities and social divisions, racism, uh, police brutality, uh, history of slavery, colonialism, these sorts of things. So all of those are very powerful and evoke very powerful emotions, but depending on which part of society you show it to, it's going to mean something different uh, as a result. So a flag is, an, uh, is a summarizing statement symbol it is a thing that you feel with then there are elaborating symbols things you tend to think with um they are used to talk about meaningful ideas and to elaborate on them the it's a little more sort of deliberate um they fall into two categories as well there are root metaphors and then there are key scenarios now root metaphors are they exist mainly to provide categories for conceptualizing the world and sorting our experience of the world into those categories okay i'll give you an example right here there are lots of them but um we've got actually a couple of metaphors going on in this um uh image from a sort of positivity website here and it asks the question do you think with your head or your heart. And then we have a picture of two heads, one with the brain floating out of it and the other with the heart floating out of it. Now, what? so what could possibly be the metaphor there? Well, the metaphor is that um, emotions and there's a model embedded in this, that emotions and that logic and rational thinking are separate things completely. And that a person can either lean towards one or towards the other. Um, our emotions don't actually reside in our heart at all. They actually reside in our brains just as much as, as the rational side of us does. Uh, but um, there actually aren't two sort of completely different ways of thinking. Everybody's rationality is affected by their emotion. Everybody's emotion is affected by their rationality. They are part of the same thing, okay? But, so you've got this mental model here that is uh, sort of talking about the order of the world. There are There is logic and rationality, and there are emotions, and people tend towards one way of thinking or the other. So that is that is already telling us that there are categories in the world. But there's another hidden model in here as well. If you look closely at these heads, this one has all the hallmarks of being a man, and this one has all the hallmarks of being a woman. Uh, the, the woman 
has a slightly smaller, more upturned nose. These are stereotypical features of women. Uh, uh, sort of smaller face overall and so forth. Notice which one of these the brain is coming out of and which one the heart is coming out of. The implication here being that men tend to think logically, women tend to think with their emotions. So there's another category going on in this picture that emotional thought is associated with femininity and rational thought associated with masculinity. So there's this other hidden meaning in here about categories, that there's something about maleness and femaleness uh, that that um, affects the way one thinks. Uh, that is not actually necessarily true. There are lots of papers that come out all the time saying, we've found brain differences between men and women. When you look at their data closely, the differences they find are slight differences in overall averages. Okay, so they have a, a normal distribution, a bell curve, right? And the problem is those ranges overlap significantly. So they, it's a very good chance if you choose any two random people, a man and a woman, that, uh, that the male you choose, the man you choose, will have a more feminine ty type of brain structure but in these terms, and the woman would have a more masculine one in these terms. So it, it's not very meaningful to actually sort of look at these at these differences as if they are sort of inborn differences, um, let alone there's been no demonstration that it actually is sort of the brain structures that lead to the way of thinking or that these brain structures are wired into our... Um, our uh, genetic uh, predisposition for male or female traits. There's, there's just not really any good evidence for that whatsoever. Uh, I know some psychologists are going to rail against that, but uh, when we, that's a whole nother debate. I, we, we can talk about that in another class. Anyways, so root metaphors give us the categories to think with. Key scenarios are ways that we use those categories and put them into action. Key scenarios imply how people should live and act. They come in the form of myths, which we studied last week, which are stories about appropriate behavior or action. In this case, it's a more narrow definition of myth than what we saw last week. These are um, key scenarios that take the form of stories, okay? And these stories serve as models for how one should act or how one shouldn't act, either way. Rituals are themselves dramatizations of the correct way to achieve success as enacted um, through the ritual. And key cultural strategies are cultural models for a successful life. Now, if I was to give you an example of a, uh, uh, a myth, um, a myth that we tell ourselves all the time in this society is the myth of rags to riches. Um, that there's that social mobility is possible and that people can pick themselves up by their bootstraps. Now, there are two problems with that. We have demonstrated that. In fact, actually, right now, the United States itself it has less social mobility than has existed for nearly a century. Okay, so there, in fact, is very little room for moving up or down on the socioeconomic ladder. Uh, in addition, when we point to examples of people who bootstrap themselves, say like Bill Gates or, um, uh, or uh, Steve Jobs, well, yeah, it's true these guys started out in garages. They also all started off with connections to investors before that. They, uh, I think Jobs worked briefly at an investment firm out of just out of college and so he already knew people who he could talk to and had relationships with so he could convince them to give him the money to start his business up um those connections matter and not everybody has equal access to those connections so this notion of rags to riches itself is kind of hiding the reality 
of social inequality, and yet we continue to talk about it and describe it to, to ourselves. In a related way, in terms of rituals, if you know the show Undercover Boss, um, you know the format is that a boss, a CEO usually, goes undercover and works at different jobs in his, in his um, company. And uh, during that time, he gets to know the workers, understand how things work, and usually sort of uncovers problems that he wasn't aware of. And part of the story that is told, part of the, this is, is that um, usually he meets many employees who are very worthy in some way. They're working hard, they're doing their best, but they're having trouble getting by. And in the end... At the end, usually the boss has these workers come meet him as himself, where it's revealed that he was undercover the whole time. And the boss tells them how hardworking they are and how impressed they were and how seriously they take them. And then they give them some kind of reward, either cash or like a cash bonus or a car or or a new job uh, advising them on something, or it could be anything. But it is this sense that they are getting ahead because they worked hard and it paid off, uh, because he took notice of it, and that's what things deserve. This ritual itself tells us a few things. It both perpetuates the rags to riches story going on, uh, but the ritual of having them come in, meet with the boss, and giving the boss the opportunity to give that individual person some kind of monetary reward for hard work is an enactment of um, of the idea of the ideology of how one succeeds in life. Now, from another perspective, it also ignores the fact that a lot of these working conditions would be improved if the boss, instead of giving a million dollars to one person or a hundred thousand dollars to one person, actually invested in safer working conditions or or better benefits or more paid time off for the workers or overall, which would benefit everybody. Instead, it is a story specifically about the individual, and the individual improves themselves through hard work again, ignoring sort of the, the, the structural inequality. This is a common theme in capitalist mythology. Um, uh, finally, key cultural strategies, um, cultural models. Great example of this is life plans, right? Our life plan is you, in America, is you go to school, right, growing up, then you apply to college, then you either get a full-time job with benefits and work hard for several decades, save up, have your family, and then retire. Or you go to college and then start a job, which hopefully lifts you up a little bit uh, in terms of socioeconomic status and have a family and eventually retire. And that's a, that's a good, fulfilling life. You have the family, you have the retirement, you are producing uh, hard work so you earn that retirement, all of those things. Again, see, this is a model for a successful life. When we actually look at people's life histories in America, very few people have life histories that actually follow that track well. And in fact, actually, it's getting less and less common. Things like student debt prevent the upward mobility uh, and oftentimes cause people to put off having families until much later in life, which also pushes some of the expenses of having families to much later in life so that instead of investing as much in retirement, they are investing more in their families right then. Um, so these things themselves are sort of, uh, again, they're just models that say this is the ideal life. Then have more to do with cultural values than they do necessarily with objective, uh, realistic sort of um, uh, conditions uh, on the ground. Finally, I want to say a little bit more about metaphors. Um, 
George Lakoff and Mark Johnson uh, in the early 80s wrote a book called Metaphors We Live By, in which they argue that metaphors are not just literary conventions, they are they are cognitive tools. They are things that we think with and live by. Uh, they are embedded in our language, but not because of the language itself, but because we have internalized the ideas behind these metaphors. So a metaphor is just a state, as opposed to a symbol, is a stated or implied comparison of the traits of one thing with the traits of another. The comparison is never one to one. If I said, um, uh, if I said, oh, I'm really tired, my feet feel like they're made out of lead. I'm not saying that if you if uh, if you ate my feet, you'd get lead poisoning, or that um, that they are literally the same weight as lead uh, in the same volume. What I am saying is just that the property of lead is that it is an extremely heavy metal, and my legs feel extremely heavy. I'm only comparing one thing between those two. I'm not saying that it's gray; my feet are gray like lead, which could be the case. Um, just the weight. So that's how metaphors work. It uses specific traits between things and compares them. There are lots of these that have embedded sort of ideologies in our everyday language. Uh, some that they identified are like arguments or war. Uh, we talk about people winning debates or losing debates. We talk about um, defending against an argument or attacking with an argument. Uh, food is thought, uh, food for thought, that phrase in and of itself. We talk about people devouring books or media um, in general. Uh, directions, up is associated with good and down is associated with bad. Um, we talk about rising to the occasion, and these are also very morally weighted statements too, moral good, moral bad. Um wouldn't sink to their level. People are people you don't like are low lifes. Uh, that sort of thing. Um, that that is an indication of the how powerful metaphors are. That they embed themselves in our ways of thinking. Now I want to move on to symbols in religious life. Symbols come to us in lots of different forms in religion. Um, one prominent one is symbolic language. This includes chanting, sacred texts, prayer, and ritual language all around. Um, one of the things about the recitation of chants, for instance, is that the rhyme and the rhythm also aid memorization of long texts, uh, and also ensure that they are replicated very faithfully. Um, people tend to actually uh, that's one of the reasons it's much easier to recite a po uh, to memorize a poem than a piece equally long piece of prose. Um, in addition, things like chanting also the rhythms and the tones create an atmosphere that is culturally appropriate to the ritual that they're being used in. Uh, in terms of Gregorian chant, which is this is the, the um, uh, this is the, the, what do you call it? Transcript, the musical transcription of a Gregorian chant, a monophonic chant from the 14th and 15th century. And, um, it is part, it is sung as part of a mass. So. All they are doing is reading these liturgical uh, passages or litur or um, prayers, oftentimes, in the form of song. Images. Religious imagery is very common, although we also have to be careful because there are also some societies where certain kinds of images are forbidden in religious um, uh, uh in the religious norms. Uh, in many parts of Islam, for instance, it's forbidden to depict uh, the prophet in any way. Uh, although 
traditionally, even in the harder core sort of interpretations of those passages, uh, where it basically forbids the sort of portrayal of any of these, any uh, uh, thing out of the Quran and so forth, they, um, there are ways around it by using text in aesthetically pleasing shapes that form images themselves. Um, one interesting thing about religious imagery is, again, they're kind of polyvocal. They can mean different things at different points in history, as well as to different people in a society. Um, we're probably, most of us are familiar with the pentagram. That is the, especially the inverted pentagram, the one with the, uh, the point facing down rather than up. Um, it's a five pointed star. Uh, interestingly, though, we find inscriptions, pentagrams going at least as far back as 3500 BC in ancient Samaria. Uh, they have been associated with uh, gods and goddesses like Ishtar, Marduk. Uh, in ancient Greece, there was Pythagoras had a cult that, in addition to the whole sort of you know Pythagorean triangle sort of the worship of geometry, it also included the idea that there were mystical properties to pentagrams. Uh, medieval Christianity, interestingly enough, used it very often. This is uh, this is the north transept rose window of the Cathedral of Amiens in France, um, and the pentagram was a very common teaching aid, which stained glass windows back then, because most people were illiterate in Europe, um, stained glass windows were a form of teaching, a way of getting theological information across to people. Well, the five-pointed star would be said to represent the five wounds of Jesus, uh, the star of Bethlehem. Uh, it can be drawn in one single line, you never have to lift your pen off the page, and thus the beginning and the end sort of blend together, and so that is often used to evoke the phrase from Revelations 22.13, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Um, in Arthurian legend, Gawain uses it as um, his um, as his uh, uh, the decoration on his armor because it represents the five knightly virtues, uh, and in places like Germany and eventually many places in Europe, it was used not to summon demons, but to repel them, to deflect evil spirits. Um, this is in a Christian context. Now compare that to modern Christian context where many, not all, but many Christian uh, uh, believers feel that this is a representation of Satan and of Satan worship. Uh, and while at the same time, however, it's a multivocal symbol, there are other members of our society who practice modern witchcraft, which is a, a practice um, that dates back to about 150 years ago, or 60 years ago, depending on which tradition you're following, uh, which sort of um, claims to revive European folk magical traditions, and with it usually a sort of reverence for nature and so forth. And the pentacle, the pentagram means something very different for them. Objects become very important symbols in religion. Uh, this can include regalia or 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 um, uh, costumes, uniforms, that sort of thing. Various instruments, whether musical instruments or say a wand or a um, a uh, um, uh, a bell or anything like that. The ritual objects can also just be things from nature. This is a passion flower. In Brazil, in the seventeen hundreds. Uh, missionaries would use the passion flower, which was native to, to that region, as a metaphor for teaching about the passion of the Christ. That is, the, the days leading up to and the crucifixion of Jesus. Um, 
the for instance the starting at the top here the three styles here represent uh and they even look a little bit like this look they represent the nails that were driven into Christ's wrists and feet um the five uh uh stamens here uh represent the five wounds that we talked about the corona is, represents the crown of thorns and the ten petals and steeples here uh, represent the ten um, apostles who remained faithful to Jesus. So Peter denied Jesus, and Jews, of course, betrayed Jesus, and so they aren't included, um, but the ten apostles remained faithful. So this was a teaching aid as, as, a, as a religious object. It was a symbol for the entire passion of the Christ. Um, food also can carry religious significance. Um, the Catholic Mass uh, and many Episcopal and Anglican churches have Holy Communion. In the Catholic tradition, uh, the wafer that is served is believed to transubstantiate. That is, it becomes the body of Christ, reenacting uh, the meal at the Last Supper. Uh there are other way, kinds of food, however, that can have religious significance. The pomegranate is a great example. In ancient Greece and Rome, it represented death. Uh, it was believed to have arisen out of the blood of Adonis. Uh, Persephone was um, tricked into staying in Hades by Hades um, for six months out of the year because she had eaten six seeds from a pomegranate when she was in Hades. Uh, uh, but ironically, it also, especially in Rome, represented fertility. Aphrodite, the goddess of love, and Hera, the goddess of marriage and childbirth, were associated with it. Uh, the juice was used as a cure for infertility. Newlywed women would wear crowns made out of the leaves of the pomegranate tree. Um, in Jewish folklore, this is one I actually just learned myself. In Jewish folklore, sometimes it's thought that there that the pomegranate has 613 seeds. In reality, it varies anywhere from like 200 to 1400. It's a, a big gap there. But the folklore is that there are 613 seeds, just like there are 613 mitzvot. Uh, mitzvot are a uh, mitzvah is a like a commandment. Um, they are things that Jews are called to do to um, uh, to honor God in some way. Um, the six hundred and thirteen mitzvot are represented by the fact that there are so many seeds, uh, but also because each seed is technically its own little tiny fruit, and this represents something very important uh, theologically about the, the mitzvot, which is that you are not bad if you do not uphold all 613. Every mitzvot, every mitzvah is its own good, right? It's its own chance to do good. And so you don't have to sort of worry because you're missing one or two or a hundred. Um, it's an interesting way of teaching theological sort of ideas about right behavior. Sounds. Sounds become symbols in religious contexts. Uh, there are symbolic sounds like words, obviously. Words singing music, uh, whether it's the sounds of the instruments themselves or, uh, or the instruments themselves that are believed to be um, sacred. Uh, there are non-linguistic utterances that come up as well, um, or paralinguistics, such as speaking in tongues in certain Pentecostal um, uh, uh, religions. Here we've got uh, Gokare and uh, Gokosho. Uh, the bell is the Gokare, and both of these come to us from mainly Tantric Buddhist traditions, uh, these particularly came come from early Tantric Buddhism in Japan, 
And they are, the decorations, the handles are decorated and in the form of what's known as a Vajra. And Vajra is a weapon described in the Vedas um, that uh, has uh, these properties of sort of indestructibility and irresistible force. So these are represented, uh, representative of those two ideas. Um, the five prongs in the Buddhist context uh, represent the five perfections, and uh, the mouth. In the case of the bell, the mouth of the bell is a sixth perception, uh, perfection, which is the idea of wisdom. And the sound of the bell itself signifies several things. Number one, it's used to drive out evil spirits and evil intent from the ritual space. Uh, second, it is the, during rituals, it is usually the sound of the Buddha teaching the Dharma, and also a sign of acceptance of wisdom and an understanding of nothingness. Um, so, it, again, it's sort of a multi it has multiple meanings tied up into this one set of sounds. Finally, the last sort of symbolism that I want to talk about is symbolic time. Time is a symbol. Time, uh, but in a much more, um, much more sort of complex way. Um, we in the in Euro-American cultures tend to, and in the globalized culture, tend to follow an idea of linear time. The idea that time moves forward. The future is in front of us, and the past is behind us, and it is constantly moving forward. Many other cultures, like in Bali. Uh, believe in a cyclical nature of time, that actually time repeats itself over and over again in multiple uh, in nested cycles, okay? Um, and so, uh, for instance, in Bali, uh, there's very little fresh water uh, that doesn't come from one of the few large mountain lakes uh, that are, and these are volcanic mountains, and so to grow rice in this region on the sides of these mountains, water irrigation has to be tightly regulated. Well, it has been so for over a thousand years through religious festivals and the festival calendar. That calendar says when certain water temples, which control the flow of the um, water down the mountainside, using gravity, uh, are opened up, which means certain rice fields will be flooded while others are dry. And then they switch until the water makes its way all the way down the mountain. The water gets enriched by ducks and other uh, and fish and other um, organisms that live in the rice paddy during that time. And so it is, um, it is a great sustainable way of doing things. Um, one of the, uh, at one point, uh, foreign, uh, developers came in and said, this is a very inefficient way to use your land. You should be watering all the time and not doing this crazy medieval calendar system of yours. And immediately crop productivity collapsed when people did that and they had to return to the religious sort of calendar um, because it was the regulation was part of an ecosystem interaction with an ecosystem that recognized that there are cycles to time to the birth and death of 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 crops and to the maintenance of life in general. Uh, in another sort of instance of cyclical time, there is a once every century festival called Ekadasa Rudra, and it's a it is a ritual that gets the entire island sort of involved, where the priests must bring balance back uh, to the world by transforming 11 powerful demons that come down from the mountain uh, to the sea and transforming them into beneficent spirits using offerings of food and, uh, and objects. 
1963, now the last scheduled uh, um, uh, Ekadasa Rudra was in 1979, but in 1963, uh, the Sukarno regime, in an effort to to spur economic development, tr- forced the priests to hold this ritual early. And as preparations for for being for it were being made, for the first time in over 120 years, Mount Agung, uh, one of the active volcanoes uh, on the island, but it had been dormant for 120 years, suddenly erupts. So it's the first time in living memory at that place that people had seen it erupt. And it was taken as a sign that disrupting the cycles had caused this. Disrupting the cycle of Ekadasa Rudra had caused this problem. Uh, and immediately they abandoned the idea. Uh, so, and it left such a a lasting impression that in 1979, when Sukarno arrives at the festival, he does not do so by helicopter for fear of aggravating the spirits on their way down the mountain. Uh, so religious cycles of time are very much um, a symbol, usually a symbol of the order of the universe, how the universe is governed. Time itself uh, will be reflected in other kinds of orderings in those societies. Well, that's it for today. That is religious symbols. Um, Hopefully you will start seeing them everywhere now. Um, I hope you all are taking care of yourself. Um, Make sure uh, you're getting plenty of sleep. That's important as students. And um, I will see you again soon.